وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to another episode in this series brought to you by Al-Madrasa Al-Umariya based on the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمُ دُعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ And your Lord said, call upon me and I will answer you All we're talking all about dua etiquettes of dua the ways of your dua being accepted, the things that might cause your dua to be rejected or might become obstacles to your dua being accepted and an explanation of some of the ad'iyah, the dua of the Prophet wasallam, which are jami'ah, they are comprehensive and cover many different situations. What we're going to talk about in this episode, or at least what we're going to start off by talking about in this episode, inshallah ta'ala, is the importance of the heart being conscious aware and connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the time of dua. Al-Imam Ahmad narrated a hadith in his musnad and this hadith from the hadith of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As radiyallahu anhuma anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qal al-qulubu aw'iyah ba'wuha aw'a min ba'w fa'idha sa'altum Allah azza wa jal ayyuha al-nas fas'aluhu wa antum muqinuna bil-ijaba فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَسْتَجِيبُ لِعَبْدٍ دَعَاهُ عَنْ ظَهْرِ قَلْبٍ غَافِلٍ The hearts are vessels. The hearts are vessels. Some of them are better vessels than others. Or some of them are more suitable vessels than others. In terms of what they can contain, the suitability of, of what they contain and their ability in terms of, you know, sometimes we talk about awa meaning ahfav, better memorization, but here just meaning more suitable for the job than others. So if you ask Allah, O oh people, ask Him while you are certain that He will respond to you. And we'd already alluded to this in a previous episode, the importance of being certain that Allah Azza wa Jal is going to answer you and having yaqeen that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to answer you. That's one of the major etiquettes of dua. And it's part of husn al billahi azza wa jal, thinking good of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Allah azza wa jal said, Ana inda dhanni abdi bi, I'm as my slave thinks of me. So thinking and having that certainty that Allah will answer my dua. And we've covered the different ways that Allah can answer your dua. It may be that Allah Azza wa Jal answers your dua directly and immediately. It may be that Allah Azza wa Jal removes an evil from you that is equal to that which you're asking for. And it may be that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala stores this dua for you until Yawm Al Qiyamah. And we had spoken about that in a previous episode. So having this yaqeen, but it's the last part of the hadith that we want for this particular episode. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَسْتَجِيبُ لِعَبْدٍ دَعَاهُ مِنْ ظَهْرِ أو عَنْ ظَهْرِ قَلْبٍ غَافِلٍ Allah does not answer a servant who calls upon him while his heart is unaware. His heart is somewhere else. His heart is inattentive, could be a good word we could use for غَافِل here. When your heart's not connected, and that's such a, a bad etiquette with Allah, You've stood before Allah Azza wa calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, begging Allah Azza wa How does it feel when you stand in front of Allah Azza wa your heart's thinking about someone else, something else, doing something different? Well, I'm hungry. Ya yeah, Allah, give me Jannah. Well, I really need to go to work now. Like, it's not befitting that you stand in front of Allah like that. Your heart has to be in, in it. Your heart has to be connected. You have to be really, you know, sincerely thinking about what it is you're asking Allah for. And we had also mentioned that this is one of the things that makes dua easier perhaps, or is easier within dua than some of the other ibadat. Some of the other ibadat to, to bring your heart to a state of being present is actually quite 
difficult, especially things like the salah and things like that, where it's easy to get distracted. But in dua, it should be the case that it's relatively easy to get to a state where your heart is attentive and your heart is aware and connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, aware of what it is that you're asking for. And it's not the case that your lips are moving, but your heart has gone somewhere else. So that's a really important etiquette of dua. And regardless of the, you know, the issue of the hadith and its authenticity, there's no doubt that the meaning here is testified to by many a hadith. So let's ask ourselves a question now. Let's see if we can summarize some of the uh, adab, the manners and etiquettes that relate to dua, just to kind of bring things together and kind of get everyone on the same page. So the first one that we're going to mention here is that the heart is present. The heart is attentive and the heart is completely focused upon what you're asking for and who it is that you're asking upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second, that you seek out the times when your dua can be accepted. Of course, Allah hears us in every moment and every time and every situation. There is no doubt. However, looking for those times, it shows your keenness. It shows your dedication. It shows your need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you're asking Allah at those times and you're waking up early before Fajr, when the rain falls, you're looking for when you're traveling, when you are uh, between the Adhan and the Iqamah, you're always looking for opportunities to get near to Allah. They are the ones who call upon Allah after Allah mentions some of his awliya. They are the ones who make dua to Allah. They are not made dua to, they make dua to Allah, seeking a means of nearness to him, looking for those times, those places, those words that will get that dua to be accepted. And we should follow that example. The third is that you present yourself before Allah in a state of humility, in a state of submission, in a state of a slave, in a state of someone who is broken and poor and needy and begging and pleading before Allah, not in the state of the one who is mutakabbir, who is arrogant and boastful and full of pride, or the one who is careless and, and feels like they don't need it. You know, oh Allah, if you want, we mentioned why we don't say inshallah in dua, because the meaning of inshallah is Oh Allah, if you want to forgive me, forgive me. And if you don't want to forgive me, I don't really care. That kind of attitude is not appropriate before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what is understood when you say, or that's what's implied when you say, inshallah, Allahumma ghfirli in shi'ta. Oh Allah, forgive me if you want. It doesn't feel like the person is pleading and begging, like the person is desperate, like the person is, is a slave before his Lord. Instead, it feels like either the person is indifferent or even worse than that, it could be that the person is arrogant. And we know that arrogance is the characteristic of Iblis, the accursed. As Allah said, Aba wa stakbara wa kana min al kafiri. He refused and he was arrogant and he was among the disbelievers. From the etiquettes that we can mention in dua is to face the qibla. Facing the Qibla is not an essential etiquette of dua in the sense that your dua is accepted whether you face the Qibla or not. But when appropriate and where it's possible, facing the Qibla is uh, something which is recommended in your dua, likewise being in a state of wudu. Again, it's not required because you can make dua to Allah in any circumstance, uh, in any hal, in any situation. However, for you to be in a state of purity, again, shows your need, your dedication, and it is the best way for you to speak privately to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I just want you to imagine, for example, if you were, let's just say that you you had a particular problem in your worldly life and you wanted to go before a king or a ruler and you wanted to ask him for help to get out of your problem. How would you stand in front of that king or that ruler? This is a worldly matter. You know, maybe a visa problem, a passport problem, uh, a problem with your housing, a problem with money. And 
you know, you've been told if you go to the ruler's majlis, the place where he sits, and you stand in front of him, you can ask him for help and perhaps he can help you. How would you present yourself? Wouldn't you wear your best clothes? Wouldn't you shower beforehand and put your perfume on and come in, you know, tidy yourself up and your appearance and stand before him and call him with the best of names and say, you know, present your case with the best, you know, the eloquence and, and sincerity. SubhanAllah, if this is the example of a matter in the worldly life, and this is an example of a king from among the kings of the worldly life, then how about the king of kings? How about the one who everything is in his hand? The one who every good comes from him and no one can protect from harm except him. Isn't it more deserving that you ask Allah Azza wa Jal in your best state, with your best words, with your best etiquette and your best appearance? And part of that is the tahara shar'iyah, the Islamic purification, it like uh, being in a state of wudu. Again, it's not a requirement for dua. You can make dua in any situation, but it is a recommendation and it's something good for a person to do, to be in wudu, to make dua. Number six, that you raise your hands when making dua, but we're going to delay the discussion on this one because inshallah ta'ala in a subsequent episode, we're going to talk a little bit more about raising the hands and there are some rules about when to do it, when not to do it. Do you raise your hands all the way up like this or do you, you know, just raise your hands like this and when? So inshallah, that is going to come up later on. Uh, we're just mentioning it in a summarized form right here. The seventh one that we're going to mention is that you begin your dua by praising Allah Azza wa Jal, by praising him the way that he praised himself and by sending salah and salam upon the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, and that is part of the etiquette, or those are part of the etiquettes of dua that inshallah ta'ala we're going to mention in a little bit more detail as we move on through the course inshallah. The eighth uh, point of the etiquettes of dua that we're going to mention is that a person precedes their dua with tawbah and istighfar. And this is something very, very important. Again, we can go into a little bit more detail later on, but having that pure heart Except the one that comes before Allah with a sound heart. It's befitting when you stand before Allah Azza wa Jal that you try to purify your heart as you try to purify your body. And just as you would wish to be pure and clean externally, you should also be pure and clean internally. And this requires uh, tawbah and istighfar. And inshallah ta'ala that will also be discussed in some detail as well. The ninth point that we're going to mention is al-ilhah, that is to plead with Allah, to, uh, to see this as a private moment between you and your Lord, a private moment. So many people talk about munajah, you know, a private moment between you and Allah and to plead with Allah, to beg in front of Allah. And Allah loves for you to plead with Him and He loves for you to beg uh, to, to beg uh, from him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. The 10th point that we're going to mention is joining between fear and hope. We mentioned this right at the beginning of the course when we talked about the prophets and the messengers, alayhim salatu wassalam, and how they used to approach uh, calling upon Allah. And we mentioned the ayah in Surah Al-Anbiya, innahum kanu yusari'una fil khayrat wa yad'unana raghaban wa rahaba wa kanu lana khashi'een. They used to race to do good deeds and they used to make dua to us in a state of fear or in a state of hope and a state of fear, hope and fear. They brought between hope and fear, even though they were prophets. Alayhim salatu wassalam, promised paradise by Allah, protected from the major sins, protected from anything that would take away from their status. And yet still, they called upon Allah in fear and hope. So we must bring these two together. We must not make the dua of the one who is so hopeful that they never, or that they, they, uh, they call upon Allah in such a way that perhaps they go outside of the etiquettes of dua and they just simply, uh, you, they are over-reliant upon their hope and they don't ever try to clean their heart because they don't think there's a need to clean it. And they say, Allah Kareem, Allah is generous, Allah will forgive me, it doesn't matter. Likewise, the one who has too much fear, 
The one who despairs and says, I make dua, but I don't ever believe that my dua will be answered. They didn't think about Allah the way that Allah deserves to be thought about. Or they didn't give Allah his, his due. They didn't give Allah his due because to say that Allah will not answer my dua, that is to think badly of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but rather to join between fear and hope, to have hope because of Allah's mercy and his generosity, his kindness, his forgiveness, but also to fear because of our sins and because of our uh, negligence and our being inattentive and unaware. And because of the fact that if, it isn't, if Allah doesn't answer us, we will lose, we will be destroyed. And so to have that hope and to have that fear together. The uh, 11th point that we're going to mention, inshallah, is coming near to Allah with his names and his attributes, his sifat, his tawheed, you know? So this is to do with coming near to Allah Azza wa Jal in, uh, in dua, through a tawassul al-mashru' the tawassul which is permitted in Islam, not the tawassul which is prohibited, and we'd already explained that in a previous episode. We're now up to the uh, 12th uh, point uh, from the etiquettes of dua, and that is to give sadaqah prior to making a dua. And this is an etiquette of dua, which is again optional. It doesn't have to be done every time, but it is something that you uh, can do that before you make dua, you give uh, sadaqah again as part of purifying yourself and as part of, uh, as part of a good deed by which you can ask Allah Azza wa Jal or which you can come near to Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. The third and final point we're going to mention in this list of etiquettes in a summarized form is that a person tries to aim for the ad'iya, the dua which is jami'a, comprehensive that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned. They try to use the same words that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned because this dua is madhinnatul ijaba. It's the one that you expect and hope will be answered. The dua of the Prophet is better than our dua. His words are better than our words. They're more suitable and more appropriate to be used in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a person tries to stick with the dua the Prophet made and tries mostly or many times to use the comprehensive supplications. I just give you a, a simple example of that. Rabbana atina fid dunya hasana. Our Lord, give us good in this world and good in the hereafter and save us from the punishment of the fire. This is a dua which is jami'. It covers everything. The good of this world, everything good in this world. The good of the hereafter, everything good in the hereafter. Saving you from the fire and ultimately that is what real salvation is. And likewise, to call upon Allah and, and probably this would be better if we mentioned it among the, the names of Allah but uh, inshallah ta'ala, we will come to it in a subsequent episode in detail. And that is to call upon Allah with his greatest name. Ismullah al-A'zam. Alladhi idha du'i bihi ajab wa idha su'ila bihi a'ta. The name that if he is made dua to with it, he answers that dua. And if he's asked by it, he gives what he is asked for. And again, I want to go into some detail about this later on, but just to briefly cover that the strongest opinions regarding the greatest name of Allah Azza wa is the first is that it is Allah. The second is that it is al Hayul Qayyum. And the third is that it isn't one name, but all of the names of Allah that are comprehensive in meaning and cover are, are wide in meaning. Um, so some of the names of Allah are restricted in meaning in the sense that the meaning is limited to a particular thing. And some of them like Al-Hay, Al-Qayyum, Allah, and so on, are very broad in meaning. They, they have many, many meanings within them. So the three opinions are Allah, Al-Hay, Al-Qayyum, or every name which has a comprehensive meaning. And there are many, many other opinions. There are tens and tens of opinions about this, but those are the three strongest. Now, what does that tell you? There's no reason why you have to choose one of these three and exclude the others. Bring them together. When you call upon Allah, call upon Him by the name Allah, call upon Him by the name Al-Hayyul Qayyum, 
call upon him by the names of Allah that are comprehensive in meaning and have many, many meanings within them. Vary the names and attributes or the names that you use and vary the way that you call upon Allah, praising him with what he praised himself with, what his Prophet Sallallahu praised him with, and following the Sunnah in terms of the etiquettes of doing so. Within that, you will regularly, inshaAllah ta'ala, be calling upon Allah with his greatest name, the name that if he is made dua to with it, he answers. And if he is asked for something through that name, he gives what he is asked for. So that brings us to the end of what I wanted to mention in this episode, which is kind of a summary, sort of a, a midway summary, if you like, of where we, ha- some of the things we've covered and some of the things we're going to cover, inshallah ta'ala. And all of those things hopefully come together in terms of the etiquettes of dua, and a person tries to bring as many of them as possible. I do really want people to bear in mind that not all of these etiquettes are obligatory, and many of them are voluntary. So, you know, I don't want someone to say, well, I don't make dua because I'm not in wudu. I don't make dua because um, I haven't got time to say such a long thing, and I only had time, so I didn't do it. Rather, a person should make dua habitually all the time and regularly, but try as much as possible to bring as many of these causes of acceptance as they possibly can. That's what Allah Azza wa Jalla made easy for me to mention in this episode, and Allah knows best. Wassalatu wassalamu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. How can you do a two second action right now that will give you a share of the reward? of everything we're doing on this YouTube channel. Simple, like this video and click subscribe. Why? It will allow YouTube to recommend our videos to other users. And imagine the huge amount of reward that could be waiting for you on the day of judgment if you did that with a sincere intention of spreading the deen of Allah. You'll be rewarded for every single person who benefits from one of our videos as a result of your like, or subscribe. That's an easy two second action that you definitely don't want to miss out on. Do it now, click like and subscribe and don't forget to make that intention.